Welcome everyone to Track E, the international track. I am your track producer, Carl Gerber, Chief Data Officer of Deloitte US. The MIT CDO IQ Symposium continues to expand our global reach with an excellent lineup of sessions that bring you a world view. This is session 3E, delivering better transport with data. TFL is London's integrated transport authority responsible for meeting Mayor Sadiq Khan's strategy and commitments on transportation in London. We run the day-to-day -day operation of the capital's public transport network and manage London's main roads. Technology and data is instrumental for us to operate our network, to make customers' journeys easier, and to plan for the future. Millions of journeys are made each day on our transport network, generating millions upon millions of bits of information. Translating this vast amount of data into intelligence to drive improvement is our goal. Lauren, our speaker, will talk about our approach to harnessing this data, and in particular, how we've used it over the past 18 months during the response to the coronavirus pandemic. I want to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and presentation materials will be available in the platform. We will have a Q&A session. Please use the Wahoova tab labeled Q&A and vote up the questions that you, you wanna see addressed. Now let me introduce Laura Sage Weinstein. Lauren, has, is the Chief Data Officer at Transport for London. She leads TFL in using our vast amounts of system data to transform how TFL plans and operates transport in London. Lauren created TFL's data and analytics department, building a team of data scientists, data software developers, and analytics translators who provide data tools for TFL to understand customer travel behavior and analytics tools to operate and plan London's vast transport network. Her team's analysis has been instrumental during the challenges of the past year, providing TFL, London city officials, UK government, and the public with information about how travel changed during 2020. Lauren joined TFL in 2002, and she's held a variety of roles working on many projects, including the launch of the contactless payment system across London's transport network. Originally from Washington, DC, USA, she has degrees from Princeton University and from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, who recently awarded her the 2019 Alumni Award for Digital Innovation. Lauren was named the 2017 UK Chief Data Officer of the Year by the CDO Club and was honored to be included in the Female Leads 20 Role Models in Data and Technology for 2017. She has also been included for several years in the Data IQs list of 100 Most Influential UK Data and Analytics Practitioners. With that, over to you, Lauren. Thank you very much, and thank you for having uh, me. I'm coming to you from a very warm uh, London, um, and I'm looking forward greatly to our session. Um, I wish I could be there in person. I uh, was saying before, um, I have uh, a strong connection to MIT, um, which I will uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about the research that we've done. Um, and I even uh, took a course uh, when I was at Harvard um, at MIT and I have some family members um, who have been there. So I'm delighted that I can come and take part today. So what I wanted to do is I want to share with you um, some slides that I put together and, um, and have some time for questions at the end. Um, so um, I'll sort of kick us off. Um, so as you heard from the background, we want to talk, I'd like to talk to you today about how we've been doing analysis and how we've sort of used data um, at this most so, you know, exciting uh, time for data and most challenging time for all of us. So um, the first question, I just need to make sure I can advance my slide. So one moment here while I make sure this happens properly. Um, 
is that, um, oh yes, so who are we? So as you would have seen from uh, the, the sort of brief description, we are responsible for the mobility in London. So this is both what you sort of think about in terms of a trans, transit transport provider running our historic underground uh, and our bus network, um, but we also, as you can sort of see from this slide below, have a range of other responsibilities. Um, we have a tram network, we have a cable car, we have uh, other sort of smaller uh, sort of networks of sort of light, light rail, um, but we also fundamentally have another function which I think from the data side is, is also sort of really important to consider because we are responsible for the main strategic roads within London. Um, we're responsible for, for all the traffic lights um, and that gives us sort of the, the sort of holistic responsibility for um, mobility in London. And we also license taxis. We have a, we work with our local parts of London, the London boroughs to deliver walking and cycling improvements. Um, we have a cycle hire, uh, program where you can sort of rent bikes. So it's a whole sort of combination of, sort of delivery and also we set uh, the strategy working with the mayor um, to deliver the sort of the trans transportation sort of needs for going forward. Um, and so that gives us a sort of a huge amount of, uh, of things that we can uh, sort of measure. And you know, this is sort of one of my favorite slides that we sort of put together. Um, and it was a, what, you know, what do we gather on a typical day? And I have said, because of course the travel has been so different um, these past 18 months, but on a typical day um, before sort of, you know, we were looking at the coronavirus uh, world we're in now, we were seeing 19 million transactions from our ticketing system uh, each day. We were seeing, um, you know, no, ranges of uh, diagnostic information, um, which we're, we're getting 500,000 rows of trained diagnostic data. I think we're even getting much more since we put together this slide, ever growing amount of data. We capture 650 million IBUS events. Now IBUS is our system that says where our buses are and records things like when our doors open, it also records messages that the drivers push uh, to play on the loudspeaker um, and it records where our buses are. And it's a vast amount of sort of events that we are sort of are gathering together um, and our traffic signal data. So it's, it's massive um, um, and it's exciting because, you know, I'm a data person, I love this. But what I have to remember and I remind myself and my teams every day, the data in itself is cool, but in and of itself, it's not enough, right? It has to be made useful. Um, so that's been sort of our watchword. And, and actually, um, it's also sort of a good chance to talk about how do we think about making it useful. And one of my heroes um, has been Florence Nightingale. Now we all know about Florence Nightingale and um, she's the sort of the founder of modern nursing um, and she's famous for that. But what not everybody may know is that she is a pioneer in the data field. She pioneered how to use and present data. So how do you visualize it? How do you sort of show it? And how do you make change? How do you sort of demonstrate what's happening with data, with evidence, but persuade people to take action? And that's really the sort of the watchword. And of course, you know, data has to be made useful. We have to sort of think about how do we, how do we sort of craft the right questions? How do we answer it? How do we communicate it properly? And in her case, um, you know, she was looking to understand how the importance of sanitation um, was for soldiers in the Crimean War. Um, uh, you know, and so for many years, she's been sort of this sort of uh, hero of mine. Oh, I never really would imagine that, you know, the, I would be working in a sort of a world of sort of public health in the same way that she did. But yes, sure enough, of course, um, as we all know, it's been um, a, a dramatic change. So. Um, what I want to talk to you now about is how we've used our data to really understand what's happening in the pandemic, how do we measure travel patterns, and how do we use that data to be helpful. Um, so here you have um, on this slide here is a poster that we had in our network um, in the spring of 2020. So this was at the time in sort of Mar March, and so end of March, beginning of April 2020 where we had to very, very quickly um, do the exact opposite of what we normally do, which is to promote public tra transport. We had to tell people not to take it. 
Um, so it was a combination of uh, our, all of a sudden our, mar our marketing department, which is, you know, normally has been encouraging people to get back into tra and travel actively, travel into London, make the most out of our city, suddenly a reversal completely to say, um, don't travel unless you're doing an essential journey. So um, my colleagues were you know, thinking about how to communicate this uh, crisply and simply and, and effectively. And of course, my job um, uh, with my team was how do we measure this? Um, how do we measure the effectiveness of our messages? How do we measure the effectiveness of government policy? Um, and how do we use this to sort of inform what was happening? And so we had to sort of think about, you know, a number of sort of key questions. So uh, we had to think, you know, are the communications coming from sort of the central government um, effective? You know, can you see uh, the changes of, from passenger behavior? We would also be giving travel advice. Are our customers adhering to this advice? Who's still traveling? And importantly, can we make sure that our key workers, people going to work in hospitals, uh, people sort of working in sort of the essential retail, can they get to work safely? And so those were the questions that we were sort of tasked, um, tasked with at the time. And so, you know, in order to do that, we had to sort of think about how do we measure and how do we sort of use data quickly and to prepare it. And so here we have um, sort of our standard sort of uh, um, metric, it's a flash statistic as it were, um, of what's happening in our network. And what you can sort of see here is um, data that's showing the taps by day and by station, and we've sort of gathered it up by different types of travel, of course, uh, uh, destinations within London. Um, you know, London, of course, is very big. We have both sort of the tourist London that we all think about when we think about Big Ben, um, Piccadilly Circus, this is our, our central sort of core. But we also do have um, a financial sector which has sort of office workers. We have an inner suburbs and we have outer suburbs. Um, inner suburbs tend to have many people who um, don't have cars and are reliant on public transportation. Outer, the outer suburbs does have sort of higher car ownership, although of course we encourage public transportation as much as we can. And so this is a, you know, it's a picture that we started to sort of put together to help understand what was happening. And of course you can see dramatically um, at the start, pre-pandemic, you know, January, February, into March, where you have our sort of our, our pre-COVID level of travel. Um, and then what happened? So when we told people not to travel, you can, and government said don't travel unless you have an essential journey, you can sort of see that happen and you can sort of see as we go ongoing um, how sort of the numbers of travel sort of have, have changed over time. And, um, and we can talk uh, more about that later. Um, we also have published this on our website. So um, I would encourage anybody to, sort of to go and, and dig into this. I think it's um, really interesting to sort of see the travel patterns that we have, uh, that we have there. So um, then, um, you know, that was sort of the first question. What is happening on the network? How many people are traveling? Um, but, you know, volume is one question. Um, and then it became very clear that um, on our Easter Sunday, we were seeing, you know, such low numbers. It was basically only 5% of what we would have expected to see. Um, you know, this is, you know, dramatically lower than, than we've ever seen before in our network since probably you know, fairly soon after uh, the underground network was uh, was opened up um, and you know except for Christmas Day when we're closed. Um, so it was dramatically sort of changing the travel behavior of our customers which was exactly what we wanted to sort of see. And then the next question that we had was okay of the people that are traveling, um, how are they traveling? Are they traveling differently? Um, how do we, we would have these new sort of peaks in terms of the day. How has that changed over time? And so this is a picture of the percentages of entries we have in our network by our 15 minute period. And what you can sort of see in this dotted line, you can sort of see what we in sort of the public uh, transport world has our sort of a standard peak, um, basically office workers coming in to the office, people sort of getting into their desks, for nine o'clock in the morning, people leaving, some people sort of leaving after work to go shopping or to dinner or to the pub or to the theater. Um, and all of a sudden we have a very different profile that's been happening. And so we, we wanted to sort of understand that um, a lot better because we want to understand who is still traveling and how, what was happening on our network. And so what's interesting here is you can sort of see, if you see this green line, which is a date that we had uh, the 27th of April, 2020, you can see of the people that are traveling, we're getting a sharper peak earlier in the morning. Um, and this is sort of interesting because we could sort of see that of the time of the day that it was busier on the network, 
um, it, it, people were traveling earlier. Now, some people would ask, well, does that mean that people change their travel patterns? And the answer is not necessarily. And this is sort of an important distinction that I think is really important. We had to understand that some people have always traveled early. Some people have always traveled late. The people with the flexibility to travel uh, in offices have been told to work from home. So a lot of office work workers start later um, or you know, closer to nine, maybe after nine. But what we were seeing was the impact of people on shifts uh, and, and in the construction industry, because a lot of them continued to work um, during this sort of this during this period, and of course, people in sort of hospital shifts, um, morning shifts, were also seeing that too. And so, this was sort of the first sort of step at sort of understanding what was happening on our network. Um, and then we wanted to understand this a little more because we wanted to make sure that we were providing the capacity to the extent that we could for the journeys that had to be made. Because again, we wanted to make sure that you could have social distancing and have as, as empty a, a, a tube as possible, particularly at that point in time uh, for you know, our customers who had to make the journey. Um, and so what we did here is we looked at sort of patterns of how do we understand how customers are traveling across the network. And this is where we've sort of gathered um, a new data set in addition to our ticketing data, which is what we're using first time. The first two slides I was showing you um, were when people use their Oyster card um, or a contactless payment card at a gate. So people who were tapping in at an entry um, and an exit on our network um, that calculates the fare. And uh, that's where you are sort of seeing them show, start their and end their journey. Um, but actually, if you look and you can sort of see in this image here, you have two images, you've got a chart, which I'll explain in a moment, and you have a map. Um, and the map is of the very complicated sort of London network. And as you can sort of see with the sort of this excerpt, you know, there are multiple places where customers in the middle of a journey can change. Um, and they can make a change from one station to another to start and end. And sometimes it's pretty clear that there's like one or two different ways that customers can change um, in a way that makes sense. I mean, obviously some people do all sorts of different patterns that you, you don't expect, but broadly most people in, in going from one spot to another spot may change uh, with a handful of stations. But you do see places like Oxford Circus, uh, Green Park, Totten Court Road, you know, places where there's lots of different lines that are coming together and a lot of opportunities to sort of change from one line to another. And so in addition to understanding whether ticket halls and entries were crowded, we wanted to make sure that the places where customers were changing from one line to another were also spaced out okay. And so one of the ways that we understand this is by using, we have information that we have stripped out the personal information from, so it's depersonalized information from devices that are using our Wi-Fi uh, network. So if a customer is sort of going to uh, sign up to use the Wi-Fi that we have provided in our stations, we, um, we, we take the, the identifying information out and we have a, a so because we, we're not looking at individuals, but we look at how groups of customers travel through the network. And one of the things that we did, because we were working closely with the construction industry to make sure that they were giving the right messages and when their uh, site uh, manager should encourage the people working in construction sites to travel, we were looking at where their problems, uh, where their pinch points at particular stations. And so here's an example at Green Park, where we were sort of seeing where construction traffic was, was coming and where our hospital traffic was coming. And actually in this one, it's broadly okay because you can sort of see here that um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of sort of the, the headline, you know, so the early parts of the day, you sort of see that peak of construction traffic, um, whereas the hospital sort of is a little bit later on. So that was okay, but we could sort of use this and monitor this to make sure that we were having uh, the network used um, to preserve sort of space for essential workers to go forward. Um, and so that's been sort of a useful, a useful sort of analysis that we did. Another piece of analysis that I want to briefly talk to you about is, you know, again, how do we sort of change the way and, and use new data techniques to answer different questions in a different way? Now, normally, as I sort of mentioned with our ticketing data, we would normally look at, you know, how people, how long people were on our trains, you know, how reliable were our journeys. Um, where people, you know, and occasionally we would have situations where people were stuck on a train and we would, and my team will, will, will if there was a sub substantial disruption, we, we would refund customers for fares if they had a major disruption. And we were particularly looking at journey time on the network. Um, but actually, you know, so you have an entry tap at the start of where your Oyster contactless payment card goes and then your journey on the train and then your exit tap. So, but the other 
way of flipping this around is actually we wanted to know what we wanted to make some assumptions. And again, this is just uh, assumptions based on on where customers were exiting what the activity that they might be doing. So as groups of people, because again, we're not looking at individuals, we don't know anything about them specifically, but looking at groups of customers, once they exit their uh, a tap, um, how long are they spending at a location? Um, and then you can also sort of look at the comparison to where that location is. Um, and then when they return to the network. And this is actually a piece of sort of analysis that we had um, started a few years ago. Um, we had initially done some of this during the London Olympics, when we were trying to look at and understand, you know, how long were people going to spectate, or people like at, at a at an event, or people like shopping, things like that. Um, and then there was some further work done. We have had a uh, a long-standing research partnership with the MIT uh, Transit Lab, and we had some students doing some analysis with us, where we would share uh, depersonalized. Uh, ticketing data. So again, we don't know who the people are, but we would would scramble the uh, the data persistently, um, and the uh, students would do analysis on patterns. And so some of this was actually sort of stems from the analysis that we had from some of our MIT uh, students before. So what we found is we can look at a station, and we can look at the numbers of people that are exiting a station. Um, and this is one of our inner London sort of stations. And we can sort of look at how long it is, how long it would be until they tapped again. So when you exit tap and then your entry tap. And what's interesting here, and I'll show you a couple of pictures here, um, you can sort of see on the left, you have the short durations where people are going to do essential shopping. So um, you know, basically going to buy what they need uh, for groceries, because at the time this was in the first part of lockdown, this is you know, only those sorts of shops were open. You didn't actually have that many people spending three and four hours at a destination. Um, people are kind of, you know, some people are going in, although we were encouraging people if they didn't have to travel even to shop to not to do that. Um, but you did see other people that were traveling. Um, you had a lot of people spending eight to 10 hours at a destination, which, which indicates to us it's likely a type of a work trip. Um, and then we also had 12 or 13 hours. So that was also popular activity duration. And that actually works pretty well in terms of making an assumption that you're, this is likely a hospital shift. So we can look at this at a number of stations. And so, for example, we were looking at, um, at, at some of our stations that were located near hospitals. So um, Bell Size Park um, is a, uh, a lovely sort of, you know, inner London, small so station at the edge of Hampstead. Um, it's fairly sleepy um, in, in terms of when you compare it to the rest of the stations, but all of a sudden it was very popular uh, comparatively. And why is that? Well, you can sort of see here where you have the Royal Free Hospital, um, a world leading hospital doing a lot of treatment uh, of uh, coronavirus patients um, in the hospital itself. And you can sort of see you have, um, you know, so this, this eight to 10 hour uh, peak, um, as well as sort of a lot of activity at the 12 to 14 hours. And those are the people that are sort of at the Bell Size Park location. They've traveled to Bell Size Park. They're there for a while and they leave. You see this in Whitechapel again with the sort of the Royal London Hospital. And you see it in Tooting Broadway, which is a similar type of hospital and a kind of similar location, uh, whereas Bell Size Park is, is a northern sub, you know, inner suburban part of London. Tooting is sort of southern. Um, what you could also see is a different type of a model in Vauxhall. Um, and this is actually a, you're seeing construction traffic here because um, you know you can see a slightly different profile and we actually you know, already had Vauxhall um, tracked anyway because Vauxhall is a place with a huge amount of development right now um, and a huge amount of construction activity going on and so it was already on our radar screen and it, and it was a chance for us to sort of understand you know how do how do stations behave in the early part of lockdown when we really were trying to uh, manage the, sort of the travel on the network to minimize as much as possible. Um, so that was sort of one of one of the examples of how we've been sort of using sort of data analysis um, as we sort of go forward and and the use is really important for us, but the, sort of the key part of this was how do we share this information. So we would share you know, the information about the numbers of people traveling, uh, when there, whether there were any hotspot locations which we wanted to discourage travel. We would share it with our operational teams for messaging, for our teams that were working. We have a stakeholder teams that work to sort of manage demand on our network. Um, and we had, in some cases, we would share it with sort of enforcement teams that were out trying to manage flows on the network as well. But we also wanted to make sure that we were sharing this information with uh, government departments. So we had 
daily uh, lengthy emails of insight and analysis that we shared with the cabinet office uh, with the Treasury, the, the Department for Transport that oversees all the transport within the UK, the Office of National Statistics that's looking at sort of trends overall, um, uh, the NHS, and many, many more people. We have a list, we had a list of sort of different, uh, you know, probably some, 100 people or so uh, from different departments that were finding this useful, as well as, of course, our own, my own colleagues, um, and the London sort of government, the Greater London Authority, were also sort of using this information to understand what's happening. Um, and so that was really sort of crucial. We also so were presenting information, I'll show you some of this as well, um, to our customers directly, because it was also very clear that we needed to give the information about what was happening, what are the times to travel on our network. And one of the ways that we did this is we have a app uh, in our uh, app in the app store called TFL Go, which is about sort of journey planning. Um, and the, as you can sort of see here, it's, you know, it's how, what are the times that are quieter times to travel um, at our station? And so I'll talk about that, um, that as well, because um, that was sort of an exciting, something I was really, really excited about um, that we've done this year um, with data to help solve one of our problems. So um, here we have sort of a picture of how we've taken this aggregated customer data and depersonalized data and how we can sort of take the patterns of footfall across our network um, and share it back to customers. Because there's a, if we're gathering information about the network, um, we want to share it back to our customers, both because just to make sure that the system runs effectively and efficiently, and also there's a, there's a sort of an exchange here. If we're going to be sort of using privacy control, but we're using our customers' data, we should be giving it back to our customers to help them make their journeys better. So here you can sort of see a quiet time tool that we sort of looked at um, and we used a combination of data on this. We've used sort of both the, sort of the ticketing data, but we also have used um, the, uh, the depersonalized Wi-Fi data to understand you know, what are the quieter times at a station uh, that, are, that are happening. And so that sort of says on the left, typically this particular station is quiet on a Tuesday. You can pick whatever day you wanted um, between, you know, near, uh, after 9.45 when the morning peak had, had, uh, had stopped until about five when people were returning from work and then again in the evening. So that was sort of information that we were sort of giving up to our customers. But what was one of the greatest um, things that I'm really excited that we've done this year is that we've launched a real-time busyness uh, sort of tool on our TFL Go app. So at the moment, we can, for our 270 stations on our underground network, give you the picture uh, in near real time of how customers are traveling. So you can sort of see, is it relatively quiet? Is it busy or is it very busy now? And this is basically taking a basically sort of thresholds of what we would expect to see um, of sort of, again, it's this depersonalized, but the Wi-Fi devices that we would expect to see on the network, how are people traveling um, and what, what counts are we seeing at a given point in time? Um, and so we, um, we sort of can monitor this information and then we can share it directly out to our customers who can sort of pick up you can pick up your app, you know, down, you know, pick up your phone, download the app from the app store and then see how busy it is. Um, and it is, you know, it has been a really sort of useful tool um, that we uh, that, that we've been able to give to our customers. Um, and it's been, um, been, you know, it's been really one of the most rewarding things that we've done um, to sort of give this information out. And then, you know, so one of the questions that we also sort of need, need to think about is, okay, how do we think about you know, the today and how do we think about sort of the recovery aspect of the sort of the pandemic? How do we understand uh, and support sort of the sort of return um, to and back to London when it's a sort of time for people to come shopping? How do we give this information um, about the network and how do we sort of give it to our customers, but also how do we give it to the retail uh, teams that are sort of basically the business improvement districts um, and sort of the our stakeholders who are in the business community to understand what's happening. And so we've been publishing a lot of information and, and you can sort of see if you go back to the first slide I showed you about the sort of the different types of, of travel um, uh, across our network over time that's been sort of very useful for sort of our our, uh, our sort of partners who are providing sort of the shops and the sort of support for sort of retail um, in London, because of course that helps uh, the recovery of London as a whole. Um, so that's that's been sort of one, way, one sort of where we go to next. So that's been sort of useful to release that information to the public. And then the other sort of example I wanna to talk to you about is how do we think about some of these other questions as we go forward? And so the next part of the, my talk is gonna be about this, 
is how do we think about how do we use data and how do we use data and understanding of travel to help build sort of sustainable futures and how do we think about uh, how do we think about understanding what's happening on the network and how do we think about then using that to promote the sort of the act of travel, walking and cycling, and then public tra transport use as well. And so um, my sort of example here is a piece that we did um, when we were looking at the return of, of uh, students back, of children back to school. So of course, uh, when the pandemic hit, we quickly, uh, schools were closed, they were closed from really about March when, you know, when schools ended for, uh, in March 2020, when schools sort of ended for the sort of Easter holidays, and in the UK, you tend to have a longish couple week Easter vacation anyway, um, and then the schools went back um, virtually remotely, basically for the rest of the sort of the year. There's a, a few students were back in the sort of the summer of 2020, the school year in the UK runs to basically now. Now is the last days, uh, last week of school. Um, and so what we wanted to do in the summer uh, of last summer was think about, because we knew the schools would be back in September, we needed to think about how did we, uh, how do we prepare? So how could we sort of work to prepare schools uh, how, and communicate with our schools directly? How did we work to um, prepare our network to make sure we could sort of carry our students? Um, and how do we sort of understand how our students were using the the trans the the bus network? And most in most cases, um, we there are not dedicated school buses. There are some for some for some schools that are the secondary, the high school type schools. But um, if for many students, they travel on sort of London buses with a a card that gives them free travel on our on our bus network um, if, they're, if they're if they're a student um, traveling to secondary school. So um, what's interesting about the sort of the London network and actually most bus most bus networks are like this um, is that you tap on when you enter the bus and there's a flat fare. So nobody taps on when you the taps off when you leave. So of course to understand. Um, how are people traveling on the buses and how busy our buses are and how are, you know, where are people going, we need to, we don't have that information, we need to infer that. And this was another sort of really uh, exciting sort of piece of analysis that we did. And we worked with, with the MIT Transit Lab for many years to sort of come up with this tool that's now um, being used by a range of sort of, of, uh, of, sort of transit agencies um, that is called ODX. Um, and it is basically, it's where you have a tap, um, you know, data from your automatic fare collection system, uh, either at a bus, when you're on the bus, or other taps if you're tapping at a station, and you combine those taps with your bus location data, and you basically create this uh, matrix that can infer where a customer exited a bus, um, based on where you see the tap again. So you have a first tap, um, you don't know where the person exited, but you see another tap and you know where the bus is along the route and you make an inference. And in terms of getting the overall patterns, it is it works very well for understanding how individuals are traveling and also it can help you build a retrospective picture of how many people are on a bus at a given time. Um, so we use this tool and we looked at our zip cards. Uh, do we sort of have a picture here of what those are? Um, to sort of see who's boarding our buses. And what you have here is you have in 2019, you have the sort of our dotted line of, of travel on our network and daily boarding. Um, and then you have, um, you know, what was happening in 2020. And we were monitoring what was happening in sort of the end of August. And then when the schools were starting and there was kind of a phase return where they were, you know, getting the students back in uh, different year groups at a time and what was happening. And you could sort of see here that you were getting about 70% of what we would expect to see. Um, and I, of who was traveling. And so that was really useful. Um, it was helpful for sort of understanding and planning the amount of bus services we would have. And we had dedicated school routes, which we don't normally do, but we had dedicated routes um, for school children um, to take them to school separated from other, other routes that were just the standard routes. Um, and we were able to use this for planning and monitoring. And then there was another interesting question, which was, okay, that's fine. That's what the uh, that's what, you know, 70% of people were doing. Um, what were the other 30% of people doing? You know, were they, were these kids in school or out of school? Cause that was a question. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time, the sort of the absence rates were such that most of them were in school. So the schools were reporting pretty high attendance rates. Um, so, so we knew that the kids were in school. And so we were trying to, trying to sort of make an assumption, uh, based on the data that we had, and it was imperfect, but it was really interesting. Um, 
whether the people, whether the kids were, were who were not riding the bus, were they walking and cycling? Because we had a really big campaign. You can sort of see the poster actually included before was encouraging kids to walk. We did posters to encourage the kids to cycle. Um, were they doing that, which would be great from a health perspective, because we really want to encourage um, as much you know, sort of outdoor health activity as possible. Um, and it also keeps our bus network, um, you know, it's good for a bus network too. Um, or were they being driven? And this is where there's sort of a mixed, um, a mixed story here, because on this picture, we have our ODX data set, and we can look in the pink, which is 2019, and the green, which is 2020. And so you can sort of see Southwark, and that's actually an inner London uh, suburb, an inner London borough. Um, and you can sort of see, actually, you can see here that, first of all, you're getting a lot of people traveling, you know, eight, about 81% of what you're expecting to see of your normal baseline. And of those who are not on your on our buses, that sort of gap in that sort of in that sort of pink bit, the distances that we've inferred through our ODX tool are walkable. You know, not all, but you know, up to certainly up to a kilometer and a little over a kilometer, a uh, kilometer and a half is a good walkable distance for a a, a child who is you know between uh, sort of uh, 12, 11, 12, you know, 12 to to sort of 16, 17 to be walking. Um, so that, you know, that makes us in, infer that those probably were getting a lot of walking trips and cycling trips, which is great. Richmond, which is an outer London um, affluent uh, so borough of London, it's more mixed. We're only seeing about half of what we would see before. And as you sort of look and see, you know, two and a half, three, three and a half, four kilometers. Now, maybe some of these children are cycling. Um, that is possible. Um, but we suspect there's it was a fair amount of cars being you know so taking the taking their kids to school and this is mixed as you know we need to be mindful of you know people are trying to to protect protect their kids and 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 manage this and in the short term you know for a while of course we're telling everybody not to be taking the public tra transportation network so we want to you know we don't want to make a judgment call here but we don't want this to be a long-term sort of car-centered recovery so this was useful information for us to understand what was happening on the network um, and really, this is about how do we then think about how do we, you know, what are the right data questions as we go into recovery, and in particular, how do, you know, one of the things that is on my mind, of course, the, the short term recovery, but also thinking about uh, the sort of climate emergency and how we sort of address that. And that's where sort of I think data has to play an important role. Um, and it's really, I think, about how have we changed, how, you know, as, as data practitioners, my team of the data scientists, my team of people producing data, you know, had to think about how do we connect with our colleagues, how do we connect with our stakeholders and with the public. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been really tough. I will, you know, it's been grueling at times, um, very hard, very challenging, but there's sort of an optimism too in terms of how we've demonstrated the value that data can play. And I think that's really important because you know, as I said, there's a real challenge for us uh, globally and a, you know, a big challenge for London to make sure that we can sort of become carbon neutral. We have a target to get there by 2030. Um, we have work to do. You can sort of see here, there's a, uh, a picture of the types of emissions of London's carbon and the role within London of different types of, of vehicles. Um, and so that's really the sort of the, you know, the change we need to sort of see and tackle next. Um, and this is where there's an opportunity. So how do we think about how do we harness data from our sensors to operate our network most efficiently? Um, how do we sort of adopt best environmental practices using the data that we have to sort of get better uh, better sort of outcomes and cleaner infrastructures and what insight can we give to our customers to encourage green travel. And so those are some of the opportunities and we have an environmental framework and an ambition to sort of get to zero carbon London um, where data really has to play a part. So um, that was sort of the presentation um, that I sort of took you through um, and I'd love to now sort of take some time to um, talk about questions. So I will uh, I will stop sharing my screen and um, we can have a chat. All right, Lauren, you spoke a lot about how you're leveraging this massive amount of data that you're collecting to generate insights and insights that matter. We had some questions that uh, would build off of that. One of the questions the audience wanted to know is, what are your uh, benchmarking practices for making decisions? So you have this data, how, how do benchmarks factor into your decision making? So that's, that's a great question. And I think, so it's complicated. Um, we actually do a lot of standard 
benchmarking. Um, and we have this, you know, it's great. We have a great analytic heritage. Um, uh, and we have years and years of sort of measuring things. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, some of our measurements, you know, we've stuck with the stuff that's sort of tried and true. Um, and we do reporting um, and we sort of, we have like key metrics, we, you know, things about bus kilometers that we operate, number of, of customers that we have, how our customers feel about us. And so we have scorecards that we are, uh, that we use. Um, we have, we look at sort of journey time on our networks. We have an all sorts of a range of sort of those sorts of things that we benchmark ourselves and we benchmark against other, other, other transport agencies. Um, you know, the so there's a, there's a great, you know, we do a lot. I think there is a challenge for us internally to do a little bit more, but it's not easy um, because it's not always easy to get those metrics produced. Um, there's a fair amount, if you think about a duck, you know, gliding across the water, it looks very calm. Some of our metrics actually take a fair amount of manual sort of intervention to sort of take stuff from one system, old systems, compare it, measure it to back, cast it, forecast it forward. So, uh, you know, there's work to be done. Um, and I would love to have it a little more automated. I think there's a real opportunity to make people's lives um, a little easier. But we do, you know, we do make sort of decisions. We have um, metrics that we use for our scorecard for TFL's performance. Um, and also we have metrics that we look at for adhering to the mayor's trans transportation uh, strategy, the transport strategy, which has a number of metrics that we have. And one of the things that we're doing now is thinking about, okay, what are these intermetrics um, that if we want to achieve um, a higher rate of active travel to go from 64% um, of journeys pre-COVID on act walking, cycling, or on, on public transit to an 80% target. How do we get there? What are the ERM steps? What are some of the sort of the connectivity steps? We have a tool called um, PTAL, which is how close a particular site is to public transit. Um, and so there's a range of them. Um, and so I would say it's, it, it's great because we have a lot. <laughs> the challenge is sometimes it's actually hard to trace through each element from a data side and there's an opportunity to get a little more uh, structured about that um, behind the scenes. So that's another thing we, we would love to do. Great. Uh, probably a similar question, but I think related and maybe even nuanced a, a little differently. There was a question about using KPIs to measure transportation services performance. So yep. I think that would address not only the production of these, but how is it influencing the decision, not only the decisions, but the way uh, people are, are yeah. performing and maybe changing over time. So if you could speak yep. to, to that part of it. So there's, there's two, um, there's a couple of things that we've done here. So our bus network is, the model in London is really interesting. Um, so much of the bus, network in the UK uh, went from public direct control and ownership and was deregulated. Um, and in much of the UK, there are multiple sort of companies that take on the revenue um, and take the basis sort of run routes for a particular city. London is a little different. Um, we actually sort of take in all the revenue and we collect it and we contract out to each bus, so, so bus companies for a basket of routes. And we basically have a new co a contract runs roughly about five years and we recontract baskets of routes together. And, and so we do have to have a lot of KPIs, things like how many, you know, what are the miles that we're running? What are the gaps in services? What is the excess wait time? And what is the excess journey time? And this is actually an interesting, there's an interesting data story about the excess wait time and the excess journey time, because Initially, we were looking at an excess wait time figure, which is essentially roughly the basically half the headway. So if a bus is coming every 10 minutes, um, on average, you would expect people to wait for five minutes. And how were our, how was the excess wait time on these routes? Now, what was interesting about technology on this is that, you know, back in back back in the day, you were had to, you stood at a bus stop and you're like, well, do I wait? Do I not wait? How long might I wait? Do I have time to get a cup of coffee? Am I going to sort of step immediately into get the coffee and the bus is going to come by and be another 10 minutes? That metric is less useful now because people have phones um, and we have we have broadcast out the when the buses are coming. So one of the things that we've done is we've shifted from a, a wait time metric of excess wait time to an excess journey time metric. So how much longer is the bus being stuck in traffic? Um, and how do we measure that um, uh, in terms of making sure that we're giving a good customer experience? 
we have metrics for the underground network called lost customer hours. So again, that is sort of is a, okay, how many, you know, how many minutes of delay has there been on our network and what was the cause? And we use that to actually drive individual sort of behaviors and decisions all across the operational teams. So if there's a fault and an error, um, you know, as a delay, whether it's an operational delay or maybe it's an asset failure and a problem, we quantify what the impact was in terms of a, a lost customer hour based on how, you know, what the length of the delay was um, and how many customers it would have affected. And so those are some of the metrics that help us um, understand the impact of our services and become, you know, really sort of customer focused to make sure that we're delivering uh, to get sort of good customer outcomes. And it's not solely just done, well, how many buses, buses are you running? It's, you know, it's clear how many trains you run, how many buses you run, that's a clear part of it, but it's also what's the impact on the customer. So you, you're definitely not just gathering and, and publishing the insights, they're actually making a profound change and, and yeah. using it to, uh, to make improvements. So um, a couple more questions came in. Um, you mentioned that you, you've developed several apps. Um, there, there's a question that kind of combines artificial intelligence. So how are you leveraging artificial intelligence and are you leveraging, leveraging that in your applications as well? Um, so we, yes, yeah, so we have a couple apps. Um, in the TFL Go app is the, sort of the newest one. Um, and that's one where we, you know, we're using the sort of the machine learning um, algorithms that we sort of built on terms of taking and harnessing the sort of the, uh, the vast amounts of sort of Wi-Fi uh sort of uh connection pings that we're seeing on our network um and understanding the sort of the routing because one of the one of the challenges is that how do you construct you know, how do you construct a journey when you're seeing sort of different different types of sort of pings at a particular location um how you know you have to then sort of take that information and almost like it's a dot to dot of, sort of constructing the journey and so we use that for that um another thing that we've done with um We've done some video analytics where, and this isn't an app per se, but it is about releasing information. So I think it's relevant. Um, we have a cycling infrastructure database where we have we have published um, on our website basically uh, all of the cycling assets. So where are the cycle lanes? Where are the signs? I think it's 500,000 images on of our. Of, we we sent people out to take pictures of you know what does a cycle lane look like, um, and we have that information available. Now, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did is that when we had our we had people sort of taking pictures, inevitably there's a face that comes in, there's a license plate that comes in, there's you know something that you think mm, well it's you know yeah it's on the public street but it's not really appropriate to have this information out. And we have a, we use sort of basically an algorithm, um, uh, AI algorithm to, to blur those, blur the faces and blur the number plates, um, but you know, not blur the, the sort of the, the stuff we needed to have. And so that was sort of an example where we did that, we did that in-house um, in my sort of uh, data science team. Um, and it was a sort of a good opportunity to sort of to use, sort of, you know, have a good use case for sort of using video analytics. Um, and, you know, and that was sort of a, a, you know, it was a good chance to sort of have a clear case of, of why new technology might be useful. Um, and, you know, we're trying to sort of create this balance of sort of trying to think about what technologies that we should sort of be using, um, but not necessarily have a technology for technology's sake. So really be sort of use case driven. Um, you know, some of the things that we're interested in is, is, is how do we sort of think about line busyness? So I mentioned the station busyness that we're doing in real time. Um, could we do, could we real time give an indication a prediction of how busy a particular train is likely to be on our network in a section of a line? Could we make a prediction of how busy a bus is likely to be? Um, because it, we we would, you know, we'd like to, we can retrospectively make an assessment on it, but we'd like to be able to sort of see it in real time or make a prediction on it. And so, so those are some of the things where I think there's a real opportunity for sort of using some advanced analytics and using sort of the sort of AI um, uh, techniques. So Lauren, we definitely have a, a very data-driven uh, audience today, and they would like to know uh, some information and maybe some um, factoids about your data volumes. Do you, do you have any aggregate uh, information, like how much data you ingest per hour, per day, per month, a any kind of... Uh, uh, I mean, we do... Process? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a great... Yeah, to sort of think about if I can remember. I mean, we, you know, it's... So we have the sort of the IBUS data, right? So that's the, uh, you know, that's sort of 650 million events in a, in a day um, that we're sort of processing. Um, and so that's been, that's pretty, pretty substantial. 
um, because it's not only where a bus is. So bus every, you know, we have some bus pings about where they are every, you know, every 30 seconds on uh, snap to location. And we also have any time there's sort of a button press. So we can do things like if a, uh, you know, where are our, and this is an, this is one that an MIT student worked on with us, where uh, are there places where drivers are pressing a button that says this bus is going to sit here to regulate the service, which is, we don't really want to do that often, but occasionally we have to. Um, we were able to do some sort of analysis of, you know, all these, <laughs> all the various different times across our 6,000, uh, you know, uh, buses and then you know, 8,000 buses when we sort of extended some of the fleets um, to where these buses were happening. Um, and so it's a fair amount of data that we were processing and having to take from an antiquated source system um, and ingest it into our, you know, into our, sort of our cloud solution. The Wi-Fi stuff is phenomenal. Um, I feel like that's massive. Um, I feel like it's, I mean, it's, it's huge. I can't quite remember exactly uh, how many pings we're getting, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, we're streaming them so quickly um, off the network that we're able to sort of see, you know, within two minutes, we're able to sort of in, ingest it. And it's like, you know, there's like a billion um, within a month, I think was what we're seeing. And it's, you know, it's, it's lots of sort of data, uh, data that we're getting, that we're getting in. And so one of the challenges, of course, is like, you know, how do you, what's the right way of sort of processing this stuff? You know, I know for, you know, one of the things that we're finding is that we initially built some of these tools and algorithms, we were doing this uh, with so the technology from 2014, uh, 2013, 2014, uh, on-premise technology, which is still massively amazing um, as compared to what we were seeing before. And before we had, you know, systems that were fair collection systems, for example, that could see, you know, travel of, you know, sort of, you know, three, you know, three million cards a day routinely, uh, you know, getting sort of transactions of touching and touching out and purchasing of 90 million transactions in a day, but we couldn't do the long tail analysis. So the first step with us was getting sort of a uh, data performance a parallel data warehouse that you can sort of get all the you know, your structured data in and do all this crunching that you could never do before. Um, and then of course now that is still uh, that is now old tech, um, and now it's all sort of cloud based. Um, doing you know, sort of doing this, um, and how do you sort of then migrate your old legacy systems to the new legacy systems and think about um, that? And also, how do you tune this? So we did have processes like our ODX process that was taking eight hours to run. It was done in in C sharp, um, and how you know how do we sort of migrate that? Um, and, and how we re, how do we sort of build some of the stuff in SQL, and how do we use it? Um, uh, how do we use this sort of in the cloud, and how do we sort of make that much more performant, um, and to be able to run stuff so that you were getting from stuff that was taking eight hours to run to being able to take like ten minutes, and then in some cases two minutes, and really just trying to rebuild it so that it would be you know much much faster. Um, and I think that's where you know it's this there's there's vast amounts, um, and it's also how do you make sure that you can get it? The challenge is the older systems. The challenges is IBUS was really never designed to, you know, to basically be sending all this data out for real-time analysis. Um, the, the Oyster system is, is very old. The contact system is newer. We built that, um, but it is still, you know, still a, a challenge to make sure that we're sort of getting it in the right platforms. Um, and so that's why we have, you know, we have sort of our data architects who are sort of thinking about anticipating things. And it's you want to anticipate for the future, but you also don't want to over egg it because you could also spend a lot of money as a public agency saying, oh, we're going to build this new and shiny thing. But if you don't have the use case, you might build something that you just, you know, you spend a lot of money, you don't, you don't get the value out of it. So it's a, it's a tight balance there. Yeah, it sure sounds like you're balancing the modernization, building the modern data platform, ingesting massive amounts of information, uh, data, and then really turning it into uh, insights. And you've even gone a step further where you've shared uh, several of your insights with the, uh, the public. Yeah. So an another, another question, and it's about your team. So you have this role called analytics translators. The, the audience would like to know a little bit about how you train them, what kind of skills are important. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a data visualization question as well. So I'll throw that mm -hmm. in there. What's the role of data visualization in, in telling your stories? And if you're willing to, uh, the audience would love to know what data visualization tool you're using. Great, okay. Uh, and actually, it's really nice that actually, it just it so happens that these questions, uh, as it so happens, come together. Um, so we have a role. We So we, so I built up our data team. Um, it was really back, they said, at the start of the Olympics. And so I set it up. Um, and we had you know data scientists doing clever stuff. 
uh, we had uh, data developers building, you know, data architects building sort of the tools. But what we didn't have, and we noticed this in 2017, is that there's this role that I was doing, um, and a couple of us were doing um, as kind of a byproduct of just running things, but we didn't have dedicated roles. So we built this data product manager role, a data, you know, data product uh, so portfolio manager to basically look after how do we get the most use out of our data. And so we have agile development teams. So we have, you know, your stream lead, we have essentially basically doing scrum mastery work. We have a product owner that is doing sort of product management of our data tools, but we also have worked very closely with our data, with our data product managers. Um, and it, and this is where people need to kind of understand enough technical stuff, but they don't have to be technical. Um, they have to be curious and they have to really think through, you know, how do you know what's the use case and how do you communicate it for and they could be people, people for people to can talk and sort of ask questions. And in fact, you know, I have a range of some of them are more technical, some of them have come and done sort of technical, uh, you know, technical work. And you know, one of my uh, lead happens to be someone, he, you know, he doesn't have to be his lead, but it just happens to someone from, from a technical stream. Um, who's come in and he runs the team uh, and manages it. And he does actually a lot of the visualization, uh, sort of some of the prototyping because he loves it. Although, you know, we, we, are, we have a stream of visualization, a uh, uh, group of visualizers that we're, you know, we, give, we basically give most of it to them to do, to do, to do in the development. Um, but, you know, he comes from a technical background, but on, on the team, we have, you know, a, uh, several people who've come from non-technical backgrounds who, you know, we have one, uh, our product manager for Wi-Fi, for example, started out in our contact center. So she started out in, you know, basically answering you know, phone calls and helping resolve customer issues and problems. She moved around, she did sort of administrative uh, work and management work and she, but she was always really interested in problem solving and she was, she's a great person at sort of getting people to sit down and talk and talk through what you need. Um, and that's fundamental. So she's our, uh, you know, she knows all the details, of course, on all, you know, all the business outcomes and the, sort of the steps and what you need to do for Wi-Fi to make it work. And so she's, you know, she has a sort of an understanding of, of the, of the tech, of the technical needs. So she knows if someone's asking her something, is it, is it workable? Or is it not workable? But her job is to sort of sit down with, you know, our people doing our demand, our marketing teams and our, you know, customer facing teams and operations. Um, and, you know, all the sort of the people, our planners, um, who look at sort of you know modeling and planning and to sort of translate what they want and sit down with our developers and say okay this is how we should prioritize what we should be doing this is where I want to see the product going so that's sort of a good example we use Power BI um, we did a uh, you know uh, 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 worked with our colleagues all across TFL to talk about okay we know there's a way to do self-service much better. We didn't have any self-service tooling. We had some sort of older, really old, because it wasn't invested in reporting platforms. And we worked with them and we, we have Power BI. And so we use that and we, um, we and so some of the things that we've shown you um, that we publish are on Power BI that, we, that we've been sort of promoting out and, and using. I and mean, it has been great. Um, and it has been, uh, you know, there's a, there's a sort of a standards that we want to sort of set in terms of best practice for setting out visualization, making it accessible, um, thinking about making it clear, thinking about how do you have standards. Um, but we also want to encourage sort of the organization and people who are data analysts, um, who, but also who want to, to sort of work through data analysis to also sort of do sort of self-service. So there is a whole self-service stream that we're doing um, as well. Wow. What a, what a journey you've been on. So as we uh, wrap up the session, do you have any uh, closing thoughts or closing comments you'd like to make? I mean, I think it's really about be focused on what you want to achieve. Um, you know, and it's, and it's the, the, the mantra that we've had, so, you know, is like, is ask yourself as an X, I need Y to do, you know, to do Z because it's London um, or Z. Um, and, you know, it's really sort of being very focused on the outcome um, and how do you use data and, as, and be a detective, like, you know, but there's a whole range of opportunities. Um, and I would say just, you know, if you throw yourself into that, um, you can make data uh, useful and, and, and it's very rewarding. So that's what I'd say. All right. Well, well, thank you, Lauren. And thank you all to the audience for participating today and submitting your questions. Uh, enjoy the rest of the symposium. There is a lot more in our international track as well as the other tracks. And we have uh, the rest of today and two more days to go. So thank you for joining. Thank you.